How did you be, how did you start to become a goalkeeper? Well, it was um, obviously when I was a schoolboy. I was at school and usual thing. Um, made my way up through the, the, the school teams, and then I was a bit unlucky. Never, I've got to say, I was always I was reserved for Surrey schools. I was reserved for London schools, and uh, never got a game basically mm. because there was no substitutes in that game, and missed out when I left school uh, in respect that. Uh, because all the scouts then for the 92 league clubs, they all wanted to watch, you know, the, the county teams, the London boys, the Liverpool boys, and all that, England schoolboy international, all the internationals. Um, so that was it. And uh, I basically, I had a trial for Fulham right. when I was 16 uh, from a local football club. And uh, the manager was a guy called Bedford Jezzard. And uh, it was a bit of player for Fulham. And he said, I'm sorry, son, you're never going to make it. Now, like when that happens, mm. you go over one of the, you know, go one or two ways. And I thought, well, I'll prove you wrong, mate. And started playing amateur football uh, for Tooting and Mitchell, right. uh, who then, actually, 1959, I was in the reserve team. And they got to the third round of the FA Cup. They nearly beat Notts Forest, who went on to win it. So it was oh, one yeah. of those things. And uh, then I eventually got in. Mm. I got in the team, and uh, I was only about uh, a season and a half in the first team. I was on the verge of an amateur cap for England mm. uh, when 1963 was a, a very bad winter, like when we just had yeah, actually, yeah. and because there was no one saw heating in those days and uh, the whole football scene closed down, professional amateur, right through for two months. Right. And a guy called Derek Ufton who actually played for Charlton, right. wicketkeeper for Kent, um, said to me, um, uh, you know, when the season started again, when they started playing again, that there were so many games to play, could um, could I play for Millwall Reserves? Because there was, there were lack of players. Mm. And I think I played about eight or nine games for their reserve team. Uh, we finished runners up in the football combination. Mm. And uh, the manager asked me to turn pro when it was just before I was 21. So that's how I became a goal. Right. So it's good to be reserved then, isn't it, sometimes? Well, it is. It is. It's <laughs> just, I think. It proves, um, you know, uh, that you know, if someone says something, don't take their word for it. Go out and prove them wrong, mm. you know. And I suppose they call goalkeepers mad, don't they? I mean, that's, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but most of most of them we spoke to have yeah. all been rejected at some stage. Yeah, yeah. You know, they've all been told that you're not good enough or you're too small. That's right. That's mm. right. Uh, and that basically happened to me. I mean, but then again, some young kids, you know, when you're a kid. Some take uh, probably two or three more years to mm. mature than, than others, yeah. and that's how it happened. So what was your coaching like at the time? Well, um, when I joined Millwall, um, uh, obviously it was just usual, you know, mm. you train with the first team and uh, at the end of it they just, the lads just shooting at you and that sort of thing. But um, I mean, in my first year at Millwall, um, we used to train on Blackheath where they... Uh, when they start the um, the London Marathon on That's there right, yeah. with Moore. Yeah. Uh, and the guy, the manager was a guy called Billy Gray, uh, who sadly passed away a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Uh, but he was brilliant. And he played for Chelsea, and he played for Notts Forest, funny enough, in the 59 mm. Cup final, he played for Burnley. Um, and because in those days, there, there was no goalkeeper coaches, there was nothing no. like that at all, was there? You know, so it was, uh, you had to try and, work and look and see off other players, bit off television, things like that. But Billy, he got hold of me. He worked me, right, he worked me socks off. Right. And he never let me, he never let me stop. He, every day after training, he would, he would coach me. So he basically was my mentor. So what sort of, <clears throat> what would be a typical training session of his? Well, it, it, was, it, was, it was all up and down, fitness, mm. shooting this way and that way, uh, but more on distribution as well. Um, right. You know, you go back to the old days in the, uh, the 60s and that, it was, you know, the goalkeeper got the ball and he kicked it downfield, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I suppose really uh, the lad, who, the keeper that really sort of done everything, uh, threw the ball out was, was Bert Charman. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the kind of thing that he used to get me doing. Don't give the ball away, you know. Make mm -hmm. sure that when you got the ball, if you, if, if you couldn't throw it, make sure you try and it's hit one of the forwards, you know, at chest height or something, so mm. you can hold it up. 
So your distribution was the most important thing for him. So obviously you, you'd have been probably slightly different from what the other teams, then, wouldn't you? So you'd obviously try and play out from the back. Well, that's right. I, that's, what, mm. that's, what I, that's what I did, you know, mm. in, in the third and fourth division, mm. you know. And, uh, Which is hard going, isn't it? It was hard going. It was hard going mm. because you, you were playing with or you were playing against old pros, you know, mm. lads that have been, have never really made it to the top. Mm. And it was hard, so much hard down there in those days. Um, and looking after yourself, you know, you had to look after mm. yourself because... Yeah. You would finish up in the back mm. of that and probably finish out the game. Do you, do you think obviously going to two and a mitchum? Mm. I mean, it's obviously an aggressive league in them days. Yes, it was. Would, would help you at Millwall. Well, everything helped. You know, in the case of like say five or six years, mm. um, uh, I from like fifteen, mm. I learnt my trade. Yeah. Whereas, you know, uh, if you go back to the pro clubs and, and, and the ground staff lads in those days. Yeah. Uh, they didn't get that sort of experience. I was playing with hard players and players that have been through mm. the mill, which helped me probably mature a lot quicker than I would have done if I'd have been, you know, a pro club. Because it does mean a, a difference from actually playing reserve football as well. Exactly. To be in a two, they wanted to win every single week, and you have that little attitude where if you don't win, you don't get your money. That's right. And That's then, right. What's what was the size of the squad at Millwall then? How, how many goalkeepers were there? Well, there was there was only two. Right. There was only two keepers. Uh, a lad called Andy Donnelly from who came down. I think he came from Clyde when I, when I mm. signed. Uh, a guy, the guy, the, the keeper I took over was a guy called Reg Davis who, who went to um, he went to Reading. But uh, that was it. It was two keepers, a first team, and a reserve keeper. Mm. You know, and normally the reserve keeper was was a young kid actually. Mm. You know, he was probably eighteen, something nineteen, right. learning, mm. trying to learn his trade. So I know it's going to be a bit. Intrusive this question. Well, what sort of money would you be earning in them days? When I signed for Millwall uh, in '63, I was on fourteen pound a week oh, yeah. in the playing season, mm. uh, twelve pound a week in the non-playing season, right. four pound for a win, two pound for a draw. So did you work off season? Uh, no, no, I didn't no. work off season. It was just one of those things that you, you you could get away with that sort of thing, you know, on that money because it wasn't a bad wage in those no, in those no, days. Relative. Um, the only the only thing I, I can remember about my contract was oh, I went at Millwall, was uh, you got a pound uh, as a bonus, a pound a thousand over twenty five thousand. Right. <laughs> and there must have been about ten games in that season, where it was a full house of thirty five thousand, mm. but there was only twenty four thousand nine hundred ninety nine <laughs> <laughs> on the gate. Yeah, yeah, I've seen them do that. Yeah. <laughs> do you know, I'm sure I had one of them contracts once. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so it fell on the gate in it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's called the nodding uh, gate. Well, it was, it, was, the, it, was, it was the chairman and secretary yeah. gate. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a few of them, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. So obviously you didn't have an agent. No, no agent. So who advised you then? Uh, well, I had to do it myself. You know, I mean, um, the, the thing was uh, when I when I was when I was working. Actually, I was in good money because I, I was working at, at Phillips at Croydon when I was amateur. Right. I was working at Phillips at Croydon. And um, probably a wage about six or seven pounds a week at the time. Mm. Uh, and playing for, for, for tooting as an amateur, you mm. used to get travel expenses, you used to get a fiver. And then playing, because there's so many games, I was mm. picking up a fiver from Mill as well. So I was not on bad wage, you know. Mm. <laughs> like, yeah. But, um, uh, you know, like uh, when, when, I, when I got in the team, uh, it, was, it was basically. Um, I don't know the amount of money that was in it. That that was it really. Um, no agents. Um, when I signed for the club, um, because it was illegal in those days, for you for the for the club to pay play pay the player. Right. Okay. It was never. It was, it was a football one of the probably Mr. Hardacre's hardline oh, nice. rules. Um, uh, but it went on. Yeah. Simple. You know, it went on. Mm. And I'll never forget when I signed for Millwall. Uh, the manager was a guy called <coughs> uh, Ron Gray, not Billy Gray. Billy Gray, he unfortunately lasted a few months, but he said to me, Alex, he said, um, you know, we want to sign you. Um, and I said, yeah, fine, because, you know, you know yeah. this is my chance. This is my chance. You always dream of being a professional footballer, yeah. you know. And uh, I took it. I said, right, no problem. And he gave me an envelope and he said to me, uh, don't open that envelope till you get home because you never know who's watching round the corner mm. at Mill. So I, I sort of went home and because I lived in South London mm. and because uh, I opened this letter, this envelope, and in it 
was 50 one pound notes, right? And also a three and six FA Cup final ticket. And uh, the FA Cup final 1963 was Manchester United against Leicester. Mm. And I went to see it, right? Mm. And uh, with a 50 pound, I had two weeks in Tossa de Mar. <laughs> <laughs> As a single lad, so, so, as a, a pre-season, that, that was a pre-season <laughs> for me. <laughs> so, so was it, what was the negotiations like? Did he come in and say, "Right, that's what you're getting, that's it, go away"? Or? Yeah, that was that was that was basically. It. I mean, I mean, you know, do you want? To, but it, the thing was, you know, you you you, you, had, you had no come, you, you couldn't say anything. That's what no. they said. Right, this is this is it. This is what you're on. Uh, do you accept that? Well, you, well, you wanted to play. You yeah, wanted to be yeah. a professional footballer. You know. And what year was that? That was 1963. Right. Yeah, 1963. And uh, ironically, uh, my first season, we got relegated to the fourth right. division. We, that was the third division. Mm. Fourth division. And like I said, then Ron Gray came in, and uh, sorry, Billy Gray. Billy Gray came in, and uh, he changed me. He changed. He changed a lot of. He brought players in uh, from Notts Forest, Roy Dwight, and mm. <clears throat> Len Julians, and uh, Hugh Curran, and people mm. like that. Uh, and we've done well in the game, so uh, it was good. But we won promotion mm. uh, back to the uh, third division. What was your bonus for that? I think it was about uh, fifty pounds, like something yeah. Just decent nothing. money. Yeah, but, days. you know that's how it was. Mm. Um, and we got through on the last game of the season, and then when we won promotion in sixty-five, sixty-six, mm. uh, we won five-one at Warsaw. Mm. And we've been on the we've got on the train from Birmingham back to uh, London, and the chairman bought one bottle of champagne to share between the lovers. <laughs> <laughs> Economy drive. Economy drive. Yeah. They put it through the gate as ten nil. <laughs> well, I think I think because um, he had a, a, a Volkswagen a garage on the old Kent Road, oh. uh, and well, we know what well, a lot of fans believe or think about Millwall fans, but uh, mm. whenever Millwall lost. His windows got put in, so <laughs> he's probably trying to yeah, save get money. money back. <laughs> so, so what would be your what would be your typical weekend? How, how many how many goalkeeping sessions did you do a week? How many what time? Uh, well, it was every day. You know? mm. I mean, uh, you know, because in those days it was forty six games, and you know, and, and uh, there was a lot of uh, <clears throat> you in the early rounds of the, of the League Cup mm. and, and FA Cup and things like that. So. Mm. You didn't get a lot of break um, until you got knocked out of those competitions. Um, so, yeah, regularly it was every day, you know, training. So, what would that be, 10 till? Or was it oh, yeah, it was 10 till, 10 till 12. Right. But then, like, Billy used to take me afterwards, so I'd do another a good hour afterwards. Mm. Um, and did the first team you trained insist of running or ball work? You did exactly. You did exactly what the first team did, you know. Right. That was it. You, you'd done your running, you'd done uh, and everything. And, and then, then you'd have obviously you'd have your, your uh, first team versus reserve practice matches, mm. five aside matches, and and different things. Obviously, they tried to vary it as much as they could. Um, but you know, as well as I do as a keeper, you, you're you're different. You're different. Yeah. You wanna you wanna you wanna do different things. You wanna mm. work. You wanna work yourself. Um, I, I don't think a lot of people or supporters realise that um, we were probably a lot fitter. Although we're not good runners, some of us, mm. but a lot fitter physically, mm. by up and down, up and down, you know, yeah. all the time, you know. So what would you, what would be your pre-match then? Because obviously the nutritionists weren't in there. <laughs> your, your physio was probably some fellow with a fag, wasn't it? It was. <laughs> no, the flat cap. And a bottle of whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> it was, have a bit of this before you go out, it'll do you the That's world right, of good. Because yeah. you, um, obviously your treatment of injuries would have been worse, wouldn't it? Yeah. But what was your typical pre-match? Because I, I know when I started, yeah. it used to be a steak and That's chips. The same with me. Steak and, chip, steak and chips. Steak and chips. Steak and chips. Sometimes you change the chicken and chips <laughs> like yeah. that, you know. So did you get a choice of that, or did you say, right, we're having this today? Yeah, because because the, the, like when you when you're away back, I mean, mm. at home games, you, I mean, it was up to yourself. Yeah. It was only when you you were playing away games and uh, you were you were sort of on the way, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you would uh, you would come around well, on the Friday and say, right, what do you want, you know? Yeah. Uh, and you said, well, you know, we want steak and chips or egg and chips mm. or whatever. And do you feel right on that? Yeah, no, but because you get used to it, yeah. you, you know that's yeah. that's the way the game was. Um, uh, there was no, um, you see, the young people today they they don't yeah. realise that we weren't allowed to go out on the pitch before the game and warm up. Right, so you just we had, did you, where did you go at Melbourne? 
well, you know you're in a drought. Before the game, you, mm. you had to arrive for quarter past two for the three, all, all three o'clock kickers, yeah. and you'd get there at quarter past two, and the manager would name the team, or he might have named it the day before, mm. and you'd just get in the dressing, get changed, and as a keeper, you'd, you'd, you'd go in, in, the, in the shower room or the bath, where the bath that's, is, that's and, sort of and throw the ball against, against, that's all you could do. You weren't allowed to go out onto the pitch and, and, and warm up. Was there a reason for that? No, it was just a law. That was just that was a, it was a football league rule. Was it? Yeah, a football league rule. Yeah, yeah. Right, so here's your pitch. You, that you're playing you game weren't on allowed to go out on that pitch in your kit until until uh, uh, the bell went in the dressing room. Right. And so, that's, so what did the other lads do then? So obviously you would run on the well, spot. They, they did. Yeah, run on the spot. That's what they could do. Yeah. yeah. It was just uh, basic things really. So, so did you do your own warm up or did? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like did the sub come and take you. No, no, no. There was no subs. <laughs> there was no subs in those days. Oh, you, there was okay. just the eleven of you, and uh, and like like what you should do. The main thing was, um, I always thought right. I needed a half an hour, like half an hour before the game. I started mm. to get changed. Yeah. I knew that when I started at say for three o'clock kickoff yeah. at half past two, by the time I'd got myself set, done my little what this and that, it would be five to three. So that I am not thinking about anything. I was yeah. just boom. Directly, I, I knew that I was ready. Right, I put the oil on and, and all that. You know, <coughs> and, uh, that was it. Just um, the so bell would go and out you go. So what would be going through your mind just before kickoff in, in them days? What, what you, you little, so obviously you could get in there. Did you get frustrated because you couldn't go out on the pitch? Yeah. Well, no, or because it, it, you, just you, know, you didn't. You didn't get frustrated now because for a simple reason you'd never done it. Yeah. You know, yeah. you just got into the habit of yeah. that was your way of, of getting yourself ready to go out, and, you know, in front of the crowd. And uh, my main thing was, you know, I'd probably get me, me centre forward or, or you know what the forwards inside yeah. forwards. Main thing to get out there and get a few balls sh shot at because yeah. you had five minutes. That's all right. you had before the kickoff. So what, when was the manager's team talker? Well, that was that was that, that could have been on the Friday. Right. It could have been before the game. You know, that was it. Right. He, he could be talking. He could go around talking to you. He'd name the team. The team would go up in the dressing room, and that was it. And he, what do you put set pieces? You know, like you see on the tactics board now. Would it be all set pieces up? No, working? you do what he's done in training. Right. You know, you, you, and during the week they would they would have sorted that out. You know, right. um, and because I'd be asked, you know, I mean, we didn't have walls like they have walls today. No, <laughs> you know? no, I mean, no. it was just. It, get on with it, really. Because yeah. I look at that, and you, you look at them all before they go on the pitch. Now, well, go, right. Right, you're doing this, and I'm thinking, well, if they trusted you on a Friday, yeah, and surely you should know what you're doing on a Saturday. Exactly. Why should you need anything else? Yeah. And but, if you uh, didn't have any subs, you'd be marking the same play anyway, wouldn't you? Of course, you would, yeah. But, um, all the time. We never had that because there was no subs. You see, there was, no. it was just one of those things. And if you got injured, you you, you played on. You either played on the left wing and I stick it up front. I stick it up front. Yeah. yeah. That's so, it. so did you get injured in the game? Yeah, I got injured. My worst injury, um, like like we all, we had injuries like uh, like you get your teeth knocked out and things like that, and uh, your fingers and whatever. But we went to um, uh, Barrow, mm. which I mean, can you imagine Millwall to Barrow? I played at Barrow. I know what it's like. Right. <laughs> well, we left at ten o'clock Friday morning for the three o'clock kick off mm. on Saturday from St Pancras up mm. to we got to Crewe. And uh, we changed trains at Crewe onto Barrow, arrived there about four o'clock in the afternoon, book in the hotel, usual thing, go down, have tea, go to the pictures, mm. come back, that's it. Get up in the morning, go breakfast, little stroll, and then to the ground. Mm. But the lads, uh, a couple of lads in the team said to me, now they have a, they have a centre forward who's uh, well, he's probably the worst, hardest man you're ever going to mm. play against in, in this division. Uh, I think his name was McLean. And uh, I said, right, OK, thanks for letting me know. And within five minutes of the game, I was down. I mean, I, went, I had to go for the ball and it was... Mm. And he's done me in my ribs, my kidneys, the whole mm. lot. And at half time, I'm just aching all over. And, but you, there's nothing else. You can't no. do it. You've got to go through with it. And because I, I went for a wee at half time right. and it's all blood and mm. everything and because we didn't have a club doctor you had to <laughs> you had to get the you know the the, mm. the home team's doctor and he came in and he said well yeah it's your kidneys you know but uh, you know uh, play on you know <laughs> and we and, and he played on and and because we got through it and uh, actually who won but um and then it's getting back yeah you know it was on the train back to crew mm. and i'm in agony 
And, and, and the thing is, we have to change the crew and get the sleeper back to London. So we arrive in, in St Pancras at 8 o'clock Sunday morning and uh, get yourself home and try and get out. But I played the following week, that's how it Did was. Did you go to hospital? No. No, no, I didn't go to hospital. See, most, most, most people who are reading this will be what, quite young, won't they? Yeah. So they just assume that the motways have been there all their lives. That's right, yeah. And, but yeah. it was all train, really, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the old all train. Your, all train yeah. journeys. All train journeys. Everything. Rubbish physios. Yeah. No nutritionists. Well, all they had was just cold sponge, yeah. you, you know, I mean... <laughs> Which has now been banned. That's right, that's <laughs> right. I mean, if, if you had, if you had uh, I mean, ultrasonic wasn't even in there. No, no the ultrasonic sounds thing. But it was just heat pads, you know, if you yeah. on your back or something like that. So, so, so in them days, obviously, you'd be going out of the pitches on a, on a Friday night. Yeah. You couldn't do that now, could you? No, no, they, I mean... Uh, I don't think the players go out the hotel now, you know, because of uh, the, you know, the, the way, well, it's the media. Mm -hmm. They're known worldwide and, you know, countrywide and there's so many different um, fans around, you know, they want, mm -hmm. you know, to pester them, really. Um, so, you know, it doesn't, it, it, it just wouldn't work today for them. No, it's just, but, but obviously the media wasn't there, was it? No. You didn't have Sky, you didn't have anything we else. Nothing, so, nothing. So you, so you were actually able to go about your, your normal life in a normal right. way. That's right. I mean, there was no... I mean, I think the only football magazine was Charlie Buckingham's Football, <laughs> at, you know, monthly or something yeah. like that. You know, that was what it was. It was just shoot, shoot, shoot match a day. Later. Did you match a day on telly? Yeah, there was... Yeah, but that was match a day. That was... But that was only one game. Yeah. And that, was, it, was it regional on a Sunday? Uh, no, not in no, those days. No, no, no. no. It was ITV and RTA never had that then. It was just... Um, Match a day, but it was never third or fourth division. No. You know, so they, they didn't know who I was or anything no. like that. Like you said, you know, you could go anywhere you liked. Mm. And on a Friday night, did anybody sneak a few beers? Probably. <laughs> 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 I, I don't, you know, to be honest, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought so, you know, honestly. I mean, well, you were there. I know, but I mean, <laughs> you, you know, you, you're your own person, yeah. you do what you yeah. own, you know. I mean, so, no, I don't, I don't think they did. Not, yeah. in, not in the teams that I played in, to mm, be honest. Because I know a few of the lads that needed a couple of pints before they go to sleep. Well, yeah, some, some, some did, uh, you know, I've yeah. heard about it, but I never, I never, I never sort of, um, sort of anyone I was with or mm -hmm. with any other than that. So how did you move to Chelsea come about? Well, in the 65-66 season, mm -hmm. uh, Millwall were doing well in the, in the third division. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were up there with Hull, Hull City. And um, I won th three under 23 caps right. under Alf Ramsey. And... Uh, which was unusual for a third division player to, to do that. I mean, this was just before the World Cup. You know, right. I mean, Bawley was in the team and right. uh, Martin Peters and Venables, they were all in, you know, and, and Smithy and all that. But um, uh, so, honestly, I, I, went, I wanted to play first division football, yeah. you know, and, and although we won promotion to the, the second division, uh, I still wanted to play first division yeah. football. And uh, uh, ironically, would you believe the manager had won two promotions on the bounce from the fourth division to the second division, mm -hmm. and they sacked him. You know, that's... That's that, progress. That's progress <laughs> for you. And uh, so uh, there was quite a few s stories in the London press, because, you know, the, the press wasn't like it is today, no. that a few clubs were in for me, i.e. Spurs were in for me. Well, so they said. Mm -hmm. You know, there was nothing about anything else. And then... Uh, we had one game to go. We'd already won promotion, but um, because of a postponement somewhere else, we we had about ten days off. And uh, I got a phone call um, from the manager at Millwall at the time, a guy called Benny Fenton, and he said that um, I want you to come to my office. He said I want you to come in, and I lived out uh, in Kent, mm. uh, Mepham actually, mm. and uh, to come in on the A2. And my sister lived in in Bexley. Uh, I lost my father years before that, but um, so I was sort of, I was the youngest of the family, so my yeah. me, me sister and my brother-in-law were, were like parents to me, if mm. I could say that. And uh, I got this phone call and, uh, and he said, uh, I want you to come in, and I went in not knowing anything. And he said to me, um, right son, he said, uh, I've got Ron Greenwood in, in my office, and nothing's been agreed, mm. nothing's been agreed. Uh, West Ham want to sign you, obviously. Mm. I just want you to go in the office and, and have a chat. So I went in and, and I knew Ron because I'd met him when I was in the under 23s. Mm. And, and he, you know, he, he was straight, quite straightforward. He said, uh, Alex, we want to sign you. Mm. Uh, I think it was Jim Standen had sort of sure. getting on a bit at uh, West Ham. 
Uh, he said, and uh, you know, we've agreed a fee of forty-five thousand mm. pounds, which then was a world record for yeah. a goalkeeper. And he said, they hadn't agreed. The manager, you know, and I thought, well, aye, aye. So I'm thinking, right, 40, I mean, I never dreamt of uh, that sort of money being paid for me. And he said, uh, so I said, well, hold on a minute, I went for nothing. Mm. You know, in, in, in three years, I mean, which was, you imagine, 45,000 pounds was a massive amount of money in 63, uh, 65, sorry. And, and, and I just said to Ron, well, and, and you'd heard it through the grapevine, through the lads when you were playing, that you know when you move, you, you they because it was it was illegal. Yeah. You know it was another football league rule that you know the clubs are not allowed to mm. give you money. And uh, because I asked Ron, which you would do, mm. you know, and he said, Alex, he said, I've got to tell you that um, we've had a, a problem. Well, we had a, a, a problem with um, Bobby Moore. Mm. He he'd asked for something to stay on at West Ham to sign a mm. contract, <clears throat> and they revoked that thing. I think they gave him more wages, but. Mm. Um, he said, but we believe that the club that we're paying the money to should mm. look after you, which was fair enough. So anyway, cut long story short, I went, I went and saw the manager and I said, uh, uh, right, I said, uh, you know, I'll go to West Ham, mm. but you've got to make sure you've got to look after me. And I told him what I thought was a good deal. I said, because I know you, you're getting 45 grand for me. Yeah. And he, he went, oh, 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 uh, right, I'll have a word with the board. And uh, that was it. So, consequently, the next day, I'm, uh, I get a phone call and say, yes, uh, everything's agreed. Come in tomorrow morning, come and sign for West Ham and go and see the chairman, he'll sort you out. And that was it. And of course, when I got into the chairman's office in his garage in, in, on the old Ken Road, uh, thank you very much, sat there with a big cigar, thank you very much for what you've done for us. Uh, go and enjoy yourself at West Ham. I said, well, you know, what's, what's, yeah. where's the... Uh, so he said, uh, oh, no, we're not doing that. We don't agree with that. I said, well, I'm not going. Mm. He said, you've got to. He said, the press are waiting there. They're following people. I said, okay, I'm not going. I said, you're not conning me. <laughs> and uh, what I did, I just got in my car and I drove across to West Ham mm. and uh, I went and saw Ron Greenwood and I told him what had happened. And he, he shook me hand. He said, Alex, he said, you're absolutely right. Thank you very much. Not many people, not many players mm. would have done that. And I apologised to him, I said, but you do understand the situation? He said, I do. And that was it. And when I got back to Millwall, Tommy Doherty was there. And uh, that was it, basically. Tommy said, you know, Peter Bonetti's going to go. He said, I've had a row with Peter Bonetti. Peter Bonetti's not happy. Mm. Um, uh, and I'm gonna, I'd like to give you a three-year contract for the first team goalkeeper. Because it was still in those days, it was two keepers. Yeah. You know, like a, 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 the number one keeper yeah. and a reserve keeper. Um, and he said, um, Peter's going to sign for West Ham. Well, mm. it's on, you know. And although, <laughs> although I'd heard stories about Tommy Dock, I thought, hold on a minute here, you know. Yeah. I said to him, I'd like to speak to the chairman, who was Joe Mears. He was a lovely man, Joe Mears. And he said, no problem. And he took me up and I saw Joe Mears. And I said to him, you know, is this right? Peter Bonetti is going to West Ham. He said, yes, Alex. He said, he said, you sign, we will sell Peter Bonetti to West Ham. Mm. So I signed. Mm. Well, you know, great. So Don't forget, this is the end of the season, you know. Is, mm. And the World Cup was, I think P Peter was in the World Cup squad yeah. anyway. Um, three days later, before he signed, Joe Mears, Joe Mears dropped dead of a heart attack. Oh. And that was, as it turned out for me now, looking back, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It wasn't much good for him, though. No, it wasn't much good for him. <laughs> <laughs> but a new chairman came in and said, Peter Bonetti's not going. Right. So now, Tommy Dot's got me and Peter. Mm. Uh, and of course, if a chairman wants Peter Bonetti, yeah. he starts the season. Mm. And uh, I don't know whether he did or not, but I, I've got a funny idea that Peter feigned an injury because he's still wanting to get away. Uh -huh. Um on the Wednesday, one of the game, one of the games on the Wednesday, and uh, I played against Southampton on the Saturday. We won 3-0, and uh, on the Monday morning, he called, Tommy Dock called Peter and I into his office and said, I've got to, I'm have going to have to play alternate games, which was, that was Tommy Dock. Yeah. That's how he, that's how he right. used to think and get sort of some publicity and something different. And mm. uh, we went training, and Frank Blunston said to me after training, 
who was a coach, he said, uh, the boss wants you back at, at, um, at Stamford Bridge. I went back there, got in his car. He said, come on. And he drove across London and I said, where are we going? He said, just wait and see. And we went to the, uh, the White House Hotel near Euston Station. And I'm sat in reception, I said, what's going on? And then the swing doors, man, and Matt Busby and Jimmy Murphy came through the door. Mm. Nice surprise. A, a nice surprise, very nice surprise. And that was it. I mean, uh, and the, one of the funniest things about it, as it turns out now, is that Matt and Jimmy, they, you know, they, they checked in the hotel and, mm. uh, and he came over and he you know, introduced himself and, and he said, Tommy, you come in my room, he said, with me. He said, Jimmy, take Alex in your room and uh, have a chat with him. And he, for about 10, 15 minutes, was trying to sell me Manchester United. He was trying to tell me how great George Best was, Bobby Charlton, Dennis Law, <laughs> Black Greer and Nobby Styles. <laughs> uh, and then Matt came in and the deal was done and that was it. So was it a fee or not? Uh, no, no. One thing uh, Matt said, uh, and I tell you, it was God's honest truth, Matt, Matt said, we don't, um, uh, we don't have any of that kind of thing going on at Manchester mm. United, but we pay good wages. Mm. And uh, I said, right. And he said... Uh, and no one else knows what anybody else is on, mm. which is fine. Yeah. And he just said, uh, I'll put you on £100 a week and £20 a week, uh, £20 pound a week bonus, so which I money. thought weren't bad money at those So what was, it, what was the house price at that time then? Uh, I was thought around about a, a decent house, probably 4000 Yeah. So that was good. Yeah, that was good yeah, money. Good, good money. Yeah. And who was, the goal, who was the other goalkeeper at the time? Well, actually, when I joined, there was Harry Gregg. Yeah. There was Pat Dunn, who won a championship medal in, in 65. He only played one season. Yeah. And uh, David Gaskell. Right, yeah. yeah. And Gassy played in the 63 Cup final. And what was Harry Gregg as bonkers as everyone makes Yeah, he was. But, I mean, but Harry was coming to the end of his career mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. And, and uh, it wasn't long after that he moved to Stoke. Right. Um, and, and I think, well, Dave Gaskell went to Wrexham. That's right, yeah. And Pat Dunn went back to, um, Pat Dunn went to, back to Ireland, and I think. And... Uh, I know he might have gone to Plymouth, I'm not quite sure, but then there was two up and the incoming goalkeepers, Jimmy Rimmer and John Connaughton yeah. came in. And so they were behind me then. So who did your train as a goalkeeper then? Well, Jack Crompton was a trainer, but he, right. was, a, he, was, a, he was a goalkeeper that played in the 48 Cup final. But it was the same thing, you know, it? it was the same, exactly the same story as before. You trained, you trained, and at the end of the, end of the training, you know, they had the shooting, but we had more... But don't forget, you're playing with better players never. Yeah, yeah. You know, no matter what team you're in, if you start at the bottom and the way you work, when you work yourself up, mm. the game becomes quicker, but it comes easier. Yeah. Because you're playing with better players, mm. and you know, directly you get the ball, people want it off you. Yeah. They didn't want it off me in the, in the fourth division. No. You know, you had to make them have it. So, 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 what was your learning process then, as you went through? Obviously, some at some part you must have had natural talent. Well, and how, now did you work on the other side of it? Well, I think I've got to say that was down to the players because I was getting, you know, getting in, mm. uh, improving in my teams, right? Mm. That the players I'm playing with made it easier for me. But I carried on, obviously. My main thing was, well, I always wanted distribution. Mm. Uh, I always believe that, you know, you're trained to be a shot stopper anyway. Mm. But that's, 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 um, that's a natural thing, you know. Mm. It's the other part of the goalkeeper, as you know, you know, you've got to organise your defence, you've got to, mm. you, you know, your distribution. You, and, and so so, so uh, who taught you them things? I taught myself. Yeah. I had to learn myself, mm. you know. Um, I mean, and as you get on in the game and uh, through, you know, year after year after year, you start to, and, and you know you've done it, mm. you know you're there. You try, you, 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 you try and go that bit further. Mm. You know, you, you've got the you, you've got the bottle to go on. And yeah. I mean, I, I before I was finishing. I mean, a few years before I was finishing, I could say to my left winger, you know, uh, if anything uh, is coming down at my my left, and that ball, that ball started on its way into that eighteen yard box. You don't come back. You go. Mm. You make your way because I'm going to get that ball and I'm going to give it to you. And that's how. That's what I used to do. So did, did you actually, on a Monday morning, go in and try and assess what you'd done on the Saturday? Or did you do it on a Saturday night as, you, as you're driving home? Or did you, like, one of the things that I'm missing, I think, from today's game is mm. that they all travel on the bus together, but they all wear headphones. Yeah, so that's right. So did you actually sit and have a few beers on the yeah, bus? Yeah, we, 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 we talked about, uh, you know, we talked about the ways, but we've done that mainly 
we'd done that mainly before the game, to be honest, mm. Neville. I mean, even when we used to train at the cliff, yeah. even with George and Bobby and Dennis, yeah. we, we, we trained from 10 to 12. That was always, it was, mm. that was a training, 10 to 12. But we would go back, even George, some afternoons, we'd go back on our own. Yeah. And yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Uh, if we didn't have a game or something, we, because the thing was, um, 10 to 12 just went like that. Yeah. And uh, we were all married, and we didn't want to go out with the kids, probably. But, <laughs> yes, it is that. But, but uh, you know, but we had to work between ourselves and, and, and practice between ourselves. So how did you know what you were doing was right? Or was it just instinctive? It was instinctive. And mm. I think, you know, directly I, I, I came to United, uh, and you're playing with, you're playing with international, yeah. you know that. And, 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 and it, was, it became so much easier. And the feeling through, through the management, really, I mean, we knew that Matt Busby, uh, he liked to play, he liked to play wingers, he liked to play mm. fair, attacking football. And the players that he bought were basically like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm. You know, directly, uh, we need someone in there to do that. We need someone, and those players, so that when, whenever I got the ball, there was always people wanting the ball off me. Mm. Yeah. You know, um, and when it became hard, when, you, when it was, you know, a tough away game or whatever, whatever game you're playing and, and you're under pressure, you had to... We'd spoke about it before. You work together, and that's what it's all about. So, what were the balls like compared to now? Well, nothing like compared to now. Uh, they were a bit heavier when I first started. Uh, I mean, the old leather ball and all that, and it got because we didn't wear gloves. I mean, we no. never wore uh, the gloves that they got today. It was just uh, a bit of spit on your hand, get some dirt yeah. on your hands, and uh, and have it that way. You know? So, when did you start wearing the gloves? Then? Uh, well, you wore you, you what we had was was um, a string glove. Yeah, I remember them. Yeah, yeah the very thick string yeah. gloves. That, I mean, they got wet. They just they stretched. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. they, they were a waste of time to be honest. But I suppose mentally, you, you felt that you mm -hmm. you know it was the right thing. I mean, so, so who actually actually said? I tell you what, this would be a good idea. Put these gloves on. Sorry, who actually said to you put these gloves on because it'll make a difference? Uh, no, it was it was just part and partial. It, it, they were, there was no one selling gloves. The, the first glove to come out, which was sold, was. Um, uh, Ron Springett. Was it? Yeah. Ron Springett brought a glove out, which was a string glove. Right. And on the fingertips it had a uh, table tennis Oh, bat. I remember, yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. And, uh, but like, when, when they got wet, they, they, they just stretched. But I, I came up with a, a solution with the laundry, you know, laundry ladies in those days, yeah. you know, in, in, in the club. Yeah. And I said, look, I said, uh, will you try bleaching them? You know, when you wash them, bleach them for me. And they really shrunk. Right. And they used to get, t I mean, they were bloody white as a <laughs> snow, you know, because yeah. they'd been bleached. But actually, the, um, the, the pimples on the, on the, on the wash thing got tacky. Yeah. So that was something that I, but I very rarely, only, only when the ball was wet. I mean, it was always. But it was, well, because there was no coating on the ball, it was quite abrasive, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. So the, so the, the table tennis back gloves, yeah. Actually worked, didn't they? Yeah, it did. Yeah. So the first form of really. That's right. Yeah. And once it changed the coating, obviously. That's it. That that's, that's what it, did. it didn't help at all when no. when uh, it became that sort of plasticky covering, didn't it? So when you went abroad, was they exactly the same balls, or were they lighter, or the same type of balls? Yeah. Well, they they, uh, they had the hexagon shape things and all that, you know, which was different to what we we played mm. in. But um, we didn't play. A, the only time we played abroad, you know, was was um, obviously pre season. Yeah. And. End of season tours didn't mean a lot anyway. No. They were only sort of um, promotional things, um, and well, you know, you talk about the European Cup. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to win the to win the European Cup, you only played nine games. But so so if you know you were going to have to play, say say that when you played Benfica. Yes. Did you actually try and get hold of a ball that Benfica used? Oh yeah. Used? I mean, they but those games you had, I mean, <laughs> you had a match balls in the dressing room because right. you went out with a match ball. You played right. for your country. You had match balls. But I'm, I'm saying, you know, the, the week leading up, would you actually gear say, right, we've got Benfica? Oh, no, the, 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 the club wouldn't give you, a, they wouldn't make you train when you play with the, you, the uh, trainer wasn't right. allowed to. He only, he's only allowed so, so many balls a season, <laughs> bloody hell. <laughs> so, so, so it must have, sometimes it, it must have moved a little bit quicker. I'm thinking like yeah. when, you, when you went to, obviously, the hotter countries, it must have moved. So how did you actually prepare for that so it wasn't a shock? Well, the thing was, when, when, when you're playing away, like in Europe, uh, you, were, you, you had a night's training before, right? Okay. You know, so and they get they had to supply the balls then. So, so you've, you've got basically a night so, to change. Yeah, it. that's all. That's all you had. With a night to change your whole way of playing. Yeah, unbelievable. If you needed to. Yeah, unbelievable. 
And like, uh, I mean, we played Gornik uh, in the quarterfinals in Poland, mm. and uh, we'd won two 0 uh, at Old Trafford in the first leg, yeah. and we got there with six inches of snow on the pitch, six inches of snow. It was sixteen below, mm. and there was a hundred and five thousand, and it was just a bowl. There was no mm. roofs, and it was just a bowl. And a hundred and five thousand of these Polish guys with the bloody what's names like hats on and all that, and they actually had sort of flattened the snow and we had to play on that. So, so, so again, did you travel with sort of trainers, what they are now? Boots? Well, rubbers. 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 I mean, you only had studs and rubbers. Right. And that's, uh, and, and the club would, would allow you two, two pair of boots a season, that's all. Was it? Yeah. Two pairs? Yeah. So what happens after that? Well, you'd have to buy your own. So was that, was that the year where George Best brought out his style of boots? That's right, he bought his boots out, yeah. Yeah, that's how that's that's how it was now. But it was, I mean, do you think that uh, the only the only time we ever got money out of uh, out of making it? I mean, all right, don't forget George Best was George yeah, Best. Yeah, yeah. You know, you got to accept that. But you know, they have a ninety nine percent of people no. players. Um, the only chance you had of earning any money uh, was getting to the cup final, mm. where there was only two boots. Was it? Yeah, well, there was only Adidas and Puma. Right, yeah. You know? And you got paid extra for and you got, whichever. You, because you were playing in the cup final, because that was the only game that was televised for 90 minutes. Right. So that's, that's the only game, and you probably got about 100 quid for it, for wearing your boots. Was that tucked in your boot before the game? Hey. Like it was, with Wales? Yeah. <laughs> was it? Just tuck it in yeah, your boots? Yeah, just tuck in the boots, yeah. But no, it was, um, uh, it was well, how, how often do you get to a cup final, to be honest? You know, you, you know out, out of your career. Mm. You know, it's, uh, and because it was an honour to play at Wembley, because, the only chance you ever had a plan at Wembley mm. was yeah, an amateur international, a schoolboy international, mm. FA Cup final, or playing for your country. Mm. So, and today, everyone's played at Wembley. Yeah. Everyone, every, every every league, everyone. It's not the same Wembley though. It's not the same. But even even before that, mm. it was the same. So so you build up to Wembley. So when you, we got to the European Cup final, yes. What was your build up like to that week? Um, the same as normal, really. I mean, the, the thing was. Obviously, we had to come. We went down to. Uh, it was a Wednesday night game, mm. and uh, we, we we left on on the Monday, so we went down Monday. We stayed uh, just in Egham, in Surrey, nice hotel, <coughs> country hotel, mm. um, which had the usual thing at the back. Like, you know, it had uh, lawns where you could where you could train and, and do a bit of training because that time of year you you, you didn't need a lot because no, no. you you were right. And um, did you make any special preparations because of who you were playing against? Uh, um, not really. The, uh, the only thing was because we knew that um, Eusebio was probably the most dangerous yeah. player with a shot, you know, from a free kick or mm. outside the box. Um, just sort of making sure that, that, you know, I had the wall right, you know, but, uh, and we just practiced that around the box. That was basically it. Mm. Uh, well, I, mean, I want three in there or I want four or whatever. Mm. Did, you not, did you not stick Nobby Styles on him? Well, Nobby. <laughs> We, that was supposed to be his job. He was a great player and Nobby done a great job against him. Mm. And, but, you know, at the end of the day, he, he could put it about as well. He was a big fella, wasn't he? Big fella. So, so going through the game, mm -hmm. actually everybody remembers the goals that yeah, yeah. the score, but then probably a Man United legend would be your save. Well, yeah, that. it's it's like everything else now. You know, you, you know, because it, if I'd have made that save in the first minute, no one would have remembered it. Because it was 1 1 and it was four minutes to go. I still remember it, because I remember watching the game. Yeah, yeah right. Because it, and it's, it's like Gordon Banks' save, you know, yeah. against Pelly. You know, your saves, it's, it's one of those things that happens. Um, in the first half, actually, he, he had a free kick and it smacked the ball, smacked the bar mm. from outside the box. I mean, I. I had no chance. I mean, I'm going to be warm. It's it's finished up right in the top angle, hit the bar and bounced out over the halfway over the 18 outside the 18 yard box. I mean, that's how uh, uh, hard he used to hit the ball. And don't forget, it was not like the ball was the upset. Yeah, I remember looking at your face going, "I knew that hurt." Yeah, because <laughs> your face. Yeah. Well, it was when he when he when he got through. Uh, I've got to be honest because the the the, the Wembley turf in that, in those days was very lush. Mm. And it would slow the ball up, you know, and that's why a lot of players in, in cup finals, because you never played on Wembley, you know, so much of, and on pitches like that, got a lot of cramp. And when that ball was played through, I think it was the first time that Nobby had let him go, you know, 86 minutes into the game, and 
Uh, I thought, I honestly thought, it's like a 50-50 a ball for me. Mm. So I've come off my line because I, I can see the ball just coming yeah. into the box and I've got, to, I've got to be on him. And as I've come off, the ball slowed up. And it's right. slowing up. And, uh, bloody hell, you're going to chip me. Yeah. Because I'm off my line. Mm. And I just stood back. And I don't know why, flash of, went through my mind, he's going to break the back of the net. Because mm. he always wanted to break that's, the back of the net. That's your, that's your instinct to hold over all them years, isn't that's it? That's right. Mm. He's going, which, if you're going back, you've got no chance. No. But I went forward. Mm. And obviously, you, the thing is, you don't take you off that ball. No. It's around you that you follow that ball. And luckily, it came straight at me, but I mean, he really hit it. But he stuck. It stuck. It's one of those that sticks. Mm. Mm. And it probably would knock me over, to be honest. <laughs> well, I did see your face. I do remember your face going. <laughs> it knocked yeah. me over. And I knew, because there was no clocks in those days, you know, there's no clocks around. Mm. You, you got the gist from the, from the lads on the bench, how long yeah. was to go. Yeah. And I knew they scored, I think, 10 minutes to go. So I knew it was mm. coming to the end. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I've got it right. I'm going to start a, a counter-attack. And my first instinct was I saw Tony Dunn on his own and I threw it to him, my fullback. Mm. To start an attack. But it's very unusual in the game that the fellow who you made a save from stands in claps you. Well, that was it. But I didn't know that, and basically, oh. until I'd, I'd thrown it, oh. and I was standing there and I'd thrown it, and he was doing that. And uh, that was it. And I thought, well, fair enough. Because he, right. he looked on television and I thought, oh, he's just blanked him. Yeah. He's yeah. clapping it, he's got shot yeah. off, and just threw the ball out. The first thing was in my mind, yeah. start another attack. That's, mm. that's, well, that's you in a zone, aren't you? Yeah. You know? and does everybody remember that save? I think is, everybody is, does. Is that the one that you're. If you go anywhere with Man United, because yeah. you're all over the world still, don't you? Yeah, yeah, that, that's everywhere. They, they just they just remember it, and because this week, uh, because we're playing at Wembley in, in the European mm. Cup final again, you know, it's happening all the time. My dad actually wrote a poem after that game. Did he? Yeah, don't, don't ask me why, but you wrote a poem about because Man United mad. Right. And he got up in the morning. He said, "Oh, look at this. I wrote a poem." Said, yeah, and. <laughs> you know, he's just come out of his arm. No, he's he's going, <laughs> or he man, he's what a problem. Oh, shut up, man! Get out of here. But it's, it's but, it's, but, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what an effect it had on him. Yeah, like yeah. he's been through the ward and been he's been shot. Yeah, I'm going. What are you doing doing poetry? And he's going. Oh, Man United, look. <laughs> shut up. Yeah. You know what I mean? uh, so we, that people forget that that's how much impact you can have on on people. Yeah, like you just an average fellow in the street. Yeah, who, lo who loves Man United for some reason. Yeah, I think I think like the longer you live uh, and after you finish playing. Uh, I mean, I keep saying to myself, every time you meet people like you do, yeah. you know, uh, I was there. Bloody hell, there must have been 250,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially, especially when they're 15. I wasn't there. Yeah. My lad was there as well, he's 15. Yeah. 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 So, so, so once you won that, you got in the dressing room, mm. what was it like after the game? Well, I think the main thing now was directly that, uh, because this was 10 years after Munich, Mm -hmm. And we had Bobby and we had Bill Fawkes, because uh -huh. Matt Busby was the was yeah. manager. Uh, and I'd only been there two years, and I'm a Londoner coming up, yeah. and, and, and the, hey, the lads were great. They, they, they welcomed mm -hmm. you and, and, and you, you know, you fitted in. Uh, but what I found, well, I say strange, no, but I could understand it, was no one ever mentioned Munich. No one ever mentioned it. Mm. It never came, you know, like, you know, like your eye in the dressing room after yeah. training and, you, you, you know, it could have been David Sadler I was talking to, but we never spoke about it. Mm. And there was a feeling that you, it was taboo, mm. you know. No one said anything, but, it's, but when that final whistle goes, of uh, cup final, it's, what do you do? You, you go to your nearest player. Yeah. We didn't. And it wasn't rehearsed. We all went to them. Mm. We all went to them because we knew how much it meant. And, mm. and actually, that was it. That was a load off of everybody's shoulders. Mm. I mean, to Matt, and, and we also knew that, you know, the... That was the, sort of like the curse being over, wasn't it? That's right, the, the family, yeah. we knew the families of, of the lads that passed mm. away were in the stand, and, and it, 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 it seemed as though everybody, it was for them. Mm. And that was it. Uh, and as it turned out, it was. Mm. Because you know? he, he built some team afterwards, didn't he? Because he begged Steele and borrowed all his players, Matt, didn't he? Well, that's right, he did. 
it was incredible, incredible, you know, to get, and they'd been to semi-finals as well before that, you know. Because he loved all the players, he just wanted to go for everywhere, didn't Well, that's he? right. Well, Jimmy Murphy, because uh, Matt was in hospital, Jimmy yeah. Jimmy got, um, well, they got amateur players coming in and everything. Mm. But, um, it's incredible when you think about where they were. That's right. You know, what, 58, wasn't it? 58 yeah, when I was born. Yeah, yeah. But 10 years later. Ten years. Uh, because that team, no, no, I mean, no disrespect to the team I played, you know, or myself, but that team, I'm positive, would have won the European Cup two or three mm. times. Because they were a great team. So you, you would have seen Duncan Edwards play, wouldn't you? I saw him as a, as a kid mm. play at Chelsea. I was he was top class, wasn't he? Unbelievable. Uh, I mean, I was, I was uh, at this awards dinner last night and, and we were talking about, about things. And because United had played Sheffield United the, year, uh, the night before in the, in the Youth Cup final, mm. uh, first leg. And Duncan Edwards was playing for Manchester United youth team in the, in, the, in the FA Youth Cup final mm. at, at just under 18. He was playing for their first team and he was playing for England. Mm. It was incredible. Do you think he's the best one you've ever seen? Yeah, I mean, I mean but I only saw him a couple of times, mm. you know. Um, but everyone says that he was, he was he, you know, you, you've got to work with players and, and you've yeah. got to be with them day in and day out. And, mm. and, and, my best player was obviously was George because mm. well we had three European footballs a year, uh, all forwards. But George was stepping class. So who was your hero as a kid then, goalkeeping wise? Bert Williams. Was it? Bert Williams and Ted Ditch weren't funny enough. Yeah, they, you know, Tottenham and Wolves and. Uh, uh, but we never had. So, so how how did you actually how did they become a hero? Just reading in the paper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was reading the paper and going to pictures like as a kid you used to go to pictures in those days and Paffy News. You always go to see the film in the cinema. Right. And you couldn't wait for Patty News because they'd have they'd have the games on. They'd have oh, clips yeah, okay. of the games, but they couldn't they couldn't put them on television. You see, right? Because it was only that one that one match a day was probably half an hour, twenty minutes, and uh, one game. Mm. So when did you start wearing your gloves professionally? Then you know, like proper gloves, as they are now. Uh, I'd, I'd, well, I'd, I never wore them. We didn't no. have them. So the balls had just changed later, had they? Yeah, you? yeah. So what about your boots then? Well, my boots were Sam. I mean, I always wore Adidas boots. That was as simple as that. I never changed. No. Um, because they, they, they obviously got that marker class on, haven't they? Yeah, that was it. I, I, I mm. never changed. And uh, when, I, when I actually, my last two seasons, I played, I went to America. When I left Old Chapel, I went to America. Mm. Because you're playing on AstroTurf then, then they yeah. had the pinball things. And, uh, and Nike was a big, mm. big uh, footwear company over there. But um, no, I never changed. Uh, it was always boots. I very, I very rarely played in rubbers. Mm, no. Very rarely played in rubbers, always boots, studs. So what was, it, what was it like playing for the, the biggest team in the world? It was magnificent. It was, but <laughs> when I went, it was just, it went too quickly, you know, if I can understand it. Mm. We won, I won the league, I won the European Cup. Mm. Great players, everything. Uh, but then when Matt, sort of stood down because he had to stand down uh, because of the injuries from, from the crash mm. were, were taking its toll on him, to be honest. Um, and then, because a new manager comes in and things started to go, mm. oh, we got the semi-finals and things like that, but when you don't win something, semi if you get knocked down, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing worse than getting beat in the semi-final. No. Uh, and actually, the, the players were getting, oh, George went on the, yeah. on the walkabout because the leash was off from that sort of thing and uh, uh, Bobby was obviously into the 70s, Bobby yeah. was coming into his getting on and Dennis and, and things like that so uh, and the managerial side didn't, wasn't working, I mean we both tried, Frank O'Farrell tried, then Tommy Dock came, we got relegated, mm. I mean I played under five managers at Manchester United, I mean but can you imagine Ryan Giggs, he yeah. played one for 20 years. But, but, but obviously the, <laughs> Is, do you think the expectations are the same now as it was then? Or do you think it's increased now because of what they've actually won? I think, I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot. Uh, yeah, I think it's increased now. Yeah, I mean, because of the way the Champions League, it's all about getting in that fourth place. Because in those days, you had to win it to, go yeah. in, to be in the European Cup. You had to be, uh, uh, you know, you had to be the winners mm. uh, uh, of the, of the, of the uh, first division, mm. which actually affected you, really, because mm. of, the, of the problems yeah. yeah, I mean, you never had that chance to go in and play in there. No, so the people who, f who f sort of followed you, Jimmy Rimmer was there for a bit, wasn't he? Well, Jimmy was there. Jimmy came yeah. in because uh, that was that was basically, um, uh, he came through because when Wilf took over, 
Uh, Wilf had been running the, the youth team and, and, mm. and the reserve team, and and Jimmy was his, you know, he was his keeper. Yeah. And it's like everything else. When a new manager comes in, he he, he could have different ideas. He he wants different players. Mm. And Jimmy played about fifty games, um, and things didn't go well for Will. So you know, I stayed on, and, mm. and uh, I did ask for transfer, but Matt Busby kiboshed it, or the, or the directors did, and mm. and that was it. But so then, you know, from then on, it was right through to. 77, 78, 79. So since you, who's the best goal you've ever had? Phew. Well, I, 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 put them, I put them on par, Peter and, and, and Edwin. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, the difference is that Peter, uh, probably more robust and big mm. and... More aggressive. Aggressive. Uh, Edwin uh, got on his job, not flashy, mm. gets on it. Distribution, absolutely fantastic. Mm. Uh, I, you know, I think they, they have been two outstanding goalkeepers. Gary Bailey? No, I don't think Gary Bailey. I mean, Gary Bailey's, um, uh, it, it, he, he got his chance after me. Mm. Um, uh, and I think <laughs> he was a silly lad in himself with his injury. Right. Um, because what happened to him was he'd done his cartilage. I think that would have been 80, when was, when was Mexico, 80, 82, mm. and uh, he'd played in the 79 Cup final, and one more, they won it, didn't they, won it against Crystal Palace, I think, mm. um, and he had to have, he, wanted, he desperately wanted to go for the World Cup in Mexico, mm. 82, mm. and he had to have a cartilage operation, because in the cartilage operation well, in those days, it was like six months on it, you know. Well, thirteen yeah. weeks at least, yeah. so three months or whatever. And I saw him, and uh, I said to him, "You know what are you doing?" He said, "Well, I'm going to play it." I said, you know, "I'm going to have the operation. I'm going to get back." I said, "You're a silly lad." I said, "Don't do it." Mm. I said, "Be a." I said, "You're not number one. You're not going to be. You're not going to. You're not going to take. Up, you're not going to get that shirt in front of uh, Peter Shilton." I said, you'll probably be number three goalkeeper like I was when I went in 70. Mm. Uh, why don't you leave it? Why don't you mm. progress, get yourself right, and then mm. in four years' time, you might have a better chance of playing mm. the World Cup. But he didn't listen. But that was Gary. Mm. You know? So when you went to the World Cup, what did it feel like to be third choice? Is it, everyone, yeah. everyone just assumes it's all right when you're first choice, aren't you? Yeah, well, the thing is... If you if you look for the history of I mean I mean you, you know I mean you game, games you played for Wales you were number one for many many years, mm. and how many other goalkeepers got their chance after you you know because you, when you got injured or very very rarely, you know um, Gordon Banks I think played eighty times for England mm. from nineteen sixty two I think uh, up until uh, early se well seventies. So who, who were the other goalies and then the squad then? Well, it was, it, well, it was, well uh, in, in my squad in 70, was Peter, there was four of us, right. but they're 28, but you come down to 22. Right. Shorts got left out, because I think he was only about 18, yeah. uh, me and Peter and, and Gordon. But we, right. Peter and I never knew, we knew we were never going to play. Hmm. You know what I mean? Because once you've got that jersey, that's your jersey. You know, very rare goalkeepers got injured. So did you, did you, when you were trained, did you look at them and try and pick things up? Of course, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, you, you, uh, I always say, well, the best goalkeeper in my, uh, or, I mean, I worked with him, was Gordon Banks. He played for Stoke City, won the World Cup. You know, he, he, he wasn't flashy, he got on with his job, he was brilliant, mm. and, and, and that was it. So what was, it, what was your training, what, his training routine then? Was it any different to yours? Uh, no, nothing, nothing more than that. Um, obviously, it was, you know, we had... Uh, the only different training that came in because we had different coaches, you mm. know, not the, the new club coaches. Yeah. You know, we had Howard Shepherds and we had Les Cocker from Leeds, mm. and they had different, not 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 a lot of different things. No specific goalkeeper training. No really. specific. I mean, they weren't goalkeepers. They weren't goalkeepers no. anyway. Um, but like you know, goalkeepers union, you help each other out. Mm. Yeah. If even if you weren't playing, you were trying to help you mm. to to be at your best. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I always find that incredibly different to outfield players. Exactly. Yeah. For yeah. some reason, I yeah. don't know why. No, but, but that's how it was. It, for some unknown reason, it's a goalkeeper's union. Mm. Well, yeah, because mm. you understand what position it is. That's right. It? So you went, you left Man United to go to America. Yeah, I mean... And that was at the time with all the razzmatazz coming on in coffins. Oh, yeah, it was, oh, it was fantastic. It was unbelievable yeah. because I knew... I knew uh, I didn't get on with Dave Sexton mm. in Army, but I went to Dallas and I played there for two seasons, which was our summer. 
Yeah. Um, and to keep myself fit, I came back and played Fortune, who right, right, were right. a good, a good non-league team. So who was your manager out in America then? A guy called Al Miller, who was American. Right. Um, uh, but Jimmy Ryan, who played with me, who actually played yeah. in the rounds when we won the European Cup in '68, mm. he was playing. There was a lot of um, English players playing over there at that time in our team. But the manager, things changed like it has here with it, with the Premiership. Mm. Foreign players came in, yeah. and we got a lot of German players, Brazilian, yeah. Argentinians. Was Beckenbauer uh, playing at that time? Well, Beckenbauer, yeah. When we played, we played in I mean, New York. I mean, it was uh, Carlos Alberto was formed back. Uh, Beckenbauer, Naiskin, Shinalia, uh, Bogacevic, so we're um, team, is it? and we're a bad team. So, so did you do anything different in America training-wise? Um, no, I think it was more with your diet, because the Americans, that was when they were really coming through. It was back, it, that's when pasta started coming in. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Didn't go down well with me. Oh. <laughs> But um, you know, f fair enough. It was all boiled chicken and pasta. And so you see, so you were the reason I ate pasta. Was it? Because <laughs> I read in one of your things that you had spaghetti bolognese before. Yeah, that's right. Spaghetti. That's and right. I went out and bought a tin of it and thought, God, this is dreadful. I know. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But that was. So you made fresh pasta, didn't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's all tinned. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was the main difference, was it? The, all yeah, the, 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 the I mean, and, and the but you you could they would sort of the training sessions were were a lot different to when when I first started because you know you could do two sessions a day, you right. know. Um, but the heat, it, obviously the heat out there and yeah. things like that. And playing on AstroTurf. Uh, that was the old AstroTurf. <clears throat> that was, that was, a, and, and the ball was different, it was heavier. Well, no, it was plastic, it was, was a lot it? heavier. And because it bounced higher, you know. So there was a lot of things to get used to. So they deaden the pitch by putting loads of sand on it? But they didn't put no sand at all. Didn't they? No, 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 no. I mean, the only time you saw sand on the AstroTurf was, um, where, when you were playing on a baseball pitch, where they, they, right. they chopped the mound off. <laughs> so was it was the medical side better? Yes. Oh yeah. 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 Mm. Well, I, I always thought, I always think that the Americans in, in, in sports mm. that they're, they're, they're probably ten years in advance of us. Mm. You know. So then you you did two years out in America. I done two years out there. You come back and then came back and uh, uh, I, I I mean I done me managerial course with the PFA. Mm done that and got me coaching badges but it was difficult to get in because um, I found that a lot of managers and, uh, and that don't forget there was no goalkeeper coaches then no. uh, a lot of managers didn't uh, who were who, who got the jobs where the, the clubs were at were some were quite a few lower division right. managers uh, players um, they didn't want someone coming in who won anything. Right, yeah. yeah. You know, Politics. and someone, I mean, it was like... Too much of a threat. Too much of a threat. Yeah. So it was very difficult. Um, so I'd done the usual thing at a pub and done this. And I took one job as a manager to help a friend of mine out in the in, uh, it, semi, uh, amateur se or semi-pro, Droy Alston, who was oh, doing yeah. quite well at the moment. I played against him. Yeah. Um, uh, it was in the North West Counties League. Mm. Um, I got there out of trouble and... And I was enjoying it. I was really enjoying it. And then the, the, the chairman came in one Thursday night after training. And he said, "This is so and so, so and so." He said, "We've just signed him." I said, "Oh, really?" He said, "He can play Saturday." I said, "Well, he can play the reserves." I said, "I'll have a look at him." He said, "No, he's playing Saturday in the first team." I said, "He's not." He said, "He is." And I went by. <laughs> that was it. Right. Never managed since. <laughs> so, what, so, how have you filled your time since then? Well, I've I've done uh, like I said, the pub. Then I then I then I became um, I got into. Um, the motor industry. I was a um, uh, transport manager yeah. uh, in Trafford Park. I'd done that. And while I was there, uh, I used to finish at one o'clock on a Saturday mm. and uh, uh, never really got into football again, basically, right. until a guy came called Jim Mossop, who used to write for the Sunday Express, you probably yeah. knew Jim, a good friend of mine. He invited us down to the uh, sports, well, the, the sports writers' mm. ladies' evening at Savoy. Right. I don't know if you've ever been, but and he had a table and and uh, Baldy was on it with Leslie and, mm. and and David Sadler came, I think, with his wife and Jeff Hurst and mm. Harry Redknapp and wives. And we sat there, and I'm sat next to Baldy, mm. uh, who was manager of Exeter. That's right. Right, and I just said to him, and I was living in Rochdale at the time, and I. Just, I said, who, who, who does your scouting for you? Yeah. you know, he said, well, we can't afford scouting, I'm balling, I can't afford. I said, look, I said, I finish at one o'clock on a Saturday, I live in Rochdale. Mm. There's Rochdale, Berry, Preston, Oldham, all these teams, Huddersfield. 
I said, I'll do it for that for you. Get me, give me something to do. He said, you wouldn't. I said, yeah, I'll do it for now. I said, I'll have a look at the teams for you. So that's how he'd done, it. He'd done a year of it with him. Uh, so like, it was ideal. Then he got the job at Southampton. Uh, Laurie McNenny phoned me up and said, Alex, Alan wants you to be the, uh, the chief scout for North West in the Premier League. So then I was on Saturday afternoons and Wednesday nights and things like that. Everton, Liverpool, City, United, Leeds. Great, I'd done that for him. And uh, we went away for a, a, a couple of weeks on, on tour to Singapore. He got an invite with, uh, uh, you know, celebrity team basically, mm -hmm. seven aside. And he said, well, he said, um, I'd have you as my goalkeeper coach down at Southampton. He said, but, um, oh, he said, you know what football's like. Mm -hmm. You sell your house, come down there, it can happen. Two weeks later, he's manager of Man City. Phoned up, you're my goalkeeper coach. Right. That's how I got back in as goalkeeper coach. Man and it was, it was the two keepers at City then? Well, it was, uh, he got Ike Immel, yeah. the German keeper, and uh, Tony Colton was there, but Tony yeah. had come back from a bad injury. Yeah. And uh, um, Andy Dibble. <laughs> Dibbs, yeah. Andy Dibbs, yeah. So that was, and Martin Margaretson was another lad yeah, there, Martin. Yeah. Um, so that was it, and then unfortunately they got relegated first season. So, so with Aki mm. what was the difference in training in them? Because obviously he's German, he's got a different way of doing Well, he did. He, he, he had no, he never thought for one moment of catching the ball. No. Everything, punch. Any shot that came in was punch. Very rarely came across it, it was punch. Did it drive you mad? Drove me mad. Absolutely <laughs> mad. Absolutely mad. And, uh, you know, it's one of them, you, you, you couldn't get through to him. Uh, he, he, he wasn't the best kickers at the ball. No, well. I don't remember that. You yeah. know, he couldn't get on the eighteen-yard box, could he? That's right, and uh, it was so difficult because mm. you know, for me to to try and get him to, you know, even to attack the ball or run at the ball properly, it was just their own way, you know. And and I think basically, uh, because City were really under pressure every game. Mm. He was getting top marks because he was diving here, he was going yeah. here, he was under pressure. He was starting most of the Because attacks. he was making saves, you know. He was starting them all the time. Uh, exactly. So kick it that yeah, far. exactly. So you see, so you had him. So he was obviously brought up as a kid to punch the ball out. Yeah. Well, was his approach any different from the other goalies to that till match days? Yeah, it was. Typical German. Right. Methodical. You know, everything mm. was at to be. Did he have a set routine? He had his own set routine. Uh, you, you could never. But. I've got to say, Nev, that there was nothing. Um, I couldn't do anything with him. No. It was just keeping him turning over. Yeah, you know what I mean. Over, yeah. You know that's all I could do. So you couldn't and I was, it, yeah. I was looking more for for, for, for Debs and, and Martin actually, because Martin was a young lad at the time, coming through, and Tony went to um, to United actually. Yeah. And then so you, see, you had Debs, you were six foot three. Yeah, yeah. And Martin was five foot eleven. That's right. So was your train any different from them? Too? Yeah, well, Dibs, Dibs was Dibs. I mean, it's bonkers. Dib, well, yeah. he was bonkers. Yeah, it's bonkers. <laughs> but he had, you see, the thing was, you know, he had problem kicking as well, Dibs. Hmm. Uh, when Martin had a good kick. Yeah, Martin's quality. Martin, yeah. he, he could really strike yeah. a good ball, you know. Um, it was like getting into his mind about catching and controlling and, and organising. Um, but uh, it didn't really work out. I mean, because managers changed, in mm. came uh, Frank Clark, who brought in Tommy Wright. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so that was it, and then because Martins really struggled then, mm. uh, and Dibs, and they were on their way. Um, so how did you approach coaching basically four different people? Uh, well, it's, it's like they're all pros. They're, 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 were, they were good, honest pros. Mm. Uh, I would say apart from him all, I've got to say that. Um, but they were willing to learn. And, you know, you could only go, I went to watch every game they mm. played in uh, and I would pick out the good, obviously the good points, mm. you, you don't knock players, no, you, you know, you, you give them the, talk about a good point, you've done that, great, and this and that. Uh, you've got a problem, a little problem there, I think we should work on that, and that's what you do. Mm. And, and, and make them stay behind with you and, and do it. Because you, you're governed by the manager. Yeah, and time. You know, is, if, yeah. if, he wants, if he wants goalkeepers in the... To, to, to play in a certain practice match, you've got to let them go. So you, you can't have more time. So I should keep them back later. So did it, did the manager then at the time give them certain responsibilities, certain areas on the pitch where they need to do things? No, I'll be honest with you. I mean, every manager that uh, I had really left it up to me. Oh, really? Yeah, right, okay. left it up to me. Uh, so did he come and talk to you about them? 
corners? Do you want two men on the post, or was that his decision? No, that was my decision. I, 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 I would say I always wanted a player on the post. Yeah. Always. That's how I. Mm. And I always. Uh, I, I know the you know the ball's lighter and things like that, but I always I don't know I didn't want them standing side on. You face the ball, mm. and and to get and to prove to them that they can do it that way because most of them stand side on. Mm. I don't know if you ever noticed that. No. Right, you know, if the corner's out to the right, yeah. they're standing like that. They're standing like that. Uh -huh. Now you can't go there. No, no. You know, they look. They're more in, expecting a shot. Yeah, so they're saying they can't do anything. They can't this. do anything in there. No, so that's just Whereas cheating, really, isn't it? you've got to go and you really yeah. go, yeah. and you can go back and you can still go out. Yeah. Have we? Should we sort of come up with a question to sort of sum it up and yeah. say thank you and mm -hmm. give it a nice book end? Yeah, what sort of question would you like? I've got things I could listen to all this all night. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know how this is going to go with everything. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so finally to finish, Alex, mm. the standard goalkeeping when you were at Man United yes. to the standard goalkeeping in the Premier League now? I think, uh, I think what will sum it up now? Uh, when I was at Manchester United, we were all six foot. Mm. Now you've got to be six foot four, six foot five, and they haven't changed the size of the goals. <laughs> Thanks very much, Alex. It's been a pleasure, mate. My pleasure. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs>